Hello to everybody joining in. We will be starting in another minute. So if you wanna grab some coffee or anything before that, please feel free. All right, let's go ahead and get started with today's program. Hello to everyone joining us from across the globe. Uh, welcome to our sixth and final workshop in the international series, How Does Sharing Genetic Sequence Data Impact Biodiversity Science and Conservation? My name is Jyotsna Pandey, and I am the Director of Public Policy at the American Institute of Biological Sciences and Executive Director for the Natural Science Collections Alliance. Uh, I am part of a small organizing committee that has taken the lead in putting together these workshops uh, and serve as PI on the NSF grant that is supporting this series. Thanks so much for joining us today. Um, before we sort of get started, I wanted to go over a few housekeeping items. This workshop is being recorded. Um, as backup, the webinar is also being live streamed privately on YouTube. The YouTube video is currently private, so it's not searchable or available publicly, but the recording will be posted online and shared with all webinar registrants shortly after the program in the next day or so. Uh, you can use the chat feature on Zoom, uh, which is at the bottom of your Zoom screen, to communicate with people on the call, including the panelists and other attendees. You may also use the chat to introduce yourselves with your name, affiliation, and the country or region that you're joining us from. And if you're experiencing any technical difficulties, please reach out to IT support Diane over chat for assistance. Um, after we hear from our speakers today, we'll have a Q&A session to address audience questions. Uh, if you'd like to ask our speakers any questions, please do type them into the Q&A box and you'll find the Q&A icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, we have the closed captioning feature uh, enabled for this program. However, I'll note that the transcription is computer computer generated, so there may be some typos or discrepancies. Um, this workshop series is sponsored by the National Science Foundation and led by the American Institute of Biological Sciences in collaboration with the USA Nagoya Protocol Action Group. Several scientific societies, as you can see on the slide, have partnered with us in this endeavor, and we deeply appreciate all the support we've received from our sister societies including the American Anthropological Association, their archaeology division, the American Association of Biological Anthropologists, and the American Society of Primatologists in raising awareness about this event. Um, the workshops in this series were organized around uh, six topics or themes, uh, and today's workshop is broadly focused on anthropology, ethnobiology, and paleobiology. We have an exciting set of talks on our program today with researchers based in, in the US and Germany, um, who will be sharing their experiences and perspectives on the bioethics of studying the culture and genome of humans and other primates and the importance of sharing genetic sequence data for such research. So today's program is co-hosted by the American Anthropological Association or AAA and the American Society of Primatologists or ASP. I would like to thank Dr. Ed Lebo from AAA and Dr. Lynn Isbell from ASP for participating in today's workshop and for for working with the organizing committee in helping this program come together. And a special thanks to Dr. Pete Brocious, who has been instrumental in developing the program and also uh, will be facilitating the discussion later today. Um, and it's been a distinct pleasure to work with my, with my fellow organizing committee members uh, over the past several months on this NSF funded series. Uh, doctors John Bates, Rachel Mayer, Rebecca adler Mazarandino, who will be speaking later today, um, Crispin Taylor and Brida Zimkus. Uh, and most of the organizing committee is present today helping with facilitation. Um, here's a general sort of overview of today's program. 
After a brief introduction and remarks from our host society representatives, we'll go over some background information about the current policy landscape and then get into the speaker presentations, which will be followed by a Q&A session and discussion. Uh, now, the main intention behind these workshops is to increase awareness among biodiversity scientists in the US and internationally about ongoing negotiations and international policy discussions around the application of access and benefit sharing principles to digital sequence information, which is being considered as part of the International Convention on Biological Diversity. And we'll learn more about these ongoing discussions in a few minutes, but through these workshops, we also want to provide a platform for the research community to learn from the experiences of others about best practices for collaborating internationally on biodiversity research so that the global scientific community can become equipped to engage in and contribute to the ongoing policy discussions. Uh, I am now going to ask my colleague and fellow organizing committee member, Rachel Meyer, who is also co-PI on this project to talk about the Nagoya Protocol Learning Portal. Uh, Rachel leads the development of this website and will provide a quick introduction of the community discussion forum that we've set up for this workshop. Take it away, Rachel. Thanks, Thanks Jetsna. I'm already getting like, teary-eyed over that this is our last workshop of the series. Um, and thanks everyone for being here. I'm really excited to see people from all over the world. Uh, thanks for putting your, your, your location and who you are in the chat. Uh, so yeah, getting into this, this website, um, we wanted to make a space available for you to continue, like to use this for teaching, um, uh, for for talking to your colleagues and for learning. Um, that's a little bit more informal, less heavy jargon than most of the other Nagoya protocol related websites that you find. Um, so the US Nagoya, Nagoya Protocol Action Group, which came together a couple of years ago and started to build up the resources through this website, learnnagoya.com. And we have a workshop page uh, here that has an, an anonymous forum at the bottom of the page. Um, so you can find this on the learnnagoya.com homepage. I think if you go to the next slide. Uh, basically for the next several months, you can type in questions or ideas that you have and we'll relay them to the speakers, um, to the, the scientific societies, the, um, and, and, and we'll try to take all of the feedback that we get from you, the participants, um, or if you watch the video or someone watches the video later on and wants to be able to put information here or questions here, we want to be able to use all of that information to develop more educational resources and, 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 and activism um, around, around this to make sure that scientists are, and, and people in these societies are represented. So um, I encourage you to go check out the website and to use this in parallel, to use this forum in parallel. Um, it's called Frempad and it's, you can be anonymous, you can use your name um, and it's a way for us to all just continue to have the conversation. So um, check, it, check that out. And also we'll be um, including a wrap up from this workshop itself, the Q and A and um, the discussion We'll be summarizing that also on this workshop page as a later learning resource for you. So thanks again. Um, looking forward to a great workshop. Thanks, Rachel. Um, and I also want to encourage our attendees today to please use the chat to share your ideas and comments and also links to resources that you found to be helpful on these topics. We do want to hear from everybody. So do so please do share your thoughts. Uh, and with that general introduction, I am now going to hand it over to our hosts for today to say a few words and then introduce our speakers. We'll first hear from ASP President, Dr. Lynn Isbell, who is a professor of anthropology at UC Davis, after which we will hear from Dr. Uh, Ed Lebo, who is the executive director for the American Anthropological Association and is a cultural anthropologist affiliated with the University of Washington. Go ahead, Lynn. Thank you. Um, I, I, let me just give you the mission statement of the ASP and also some of the guiding principles for those of you who um, don't know about us. It's a nonprofit professional association dedicated to the scientific study of primates. The membership is a diverse community of individuals who support research and facilitate better science about primates, ensure the conservation and welfare of primates, and educate the public and policy makers about primates. Among the guiding principles are that the society values all primates, primatologists and ethically sound and scientifically valid research with non-human primates. 
It promotes exchange, it promotes exchanges, values, and supports scientific research and education about non-human primates. It shares resource, resources through interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary collaborations and cooperations, and provides and supports training for practitioners, students, and primatologists in primate habitat countries. All of these uh, values, I think, are going to be um, represented and discussed at today's workshop. So we're happy to, to join here in this workshop. Thank you. Thanks, Lynn. And next is Ed Lebo from the American Anthropological Association. You'd think after two years of this, I'd remember to unmute myself. Thank you and good day to you all. I am Ed Lebo. Uh, as George Smith says, uh, I am the executive director of the American Anthropological Association, and we are pleased to co-host along with the American Society of Primatologists this workshop today. Our association is one of the older and larger scholarly societies for the field of anthropology, and we are active in a number of alliances that aim to advance the field by setting standards both for intellectual rigor and responsible professional conduct. One such alliance that I think is important uh, today is the American Association for the Advancement of Sciences Coalition for Science and Human Rights, which fosters the responsible practice and application of science in service of society and addresses the legal, ethical, and human rights considerations to which scientific research gives rise. You'll hear a great deal of concrete examples and discussion and recommendations about digital genetic sequencing um, and the access and benefit sharing. In the course of uh, this workshop, we regard this as directly adjacent to the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights, especially Article 15 in the 1966 International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, which memorializes the right of everyone to the benefits of science progress and its applications. We look forward to what I'm sure you will find to be a thought-provoking uh, discussion. Uh, and with that, uh, we will turn to our featured speakers. Um, I'm, I'm going to introduce them uh, one by one, uh, just as they uh, begin their brief presentations. And so first, I believe we're going to hear from uh, Dr. Augustine Fuentes, who is a professor I'm at- Sorry, Ed, Ed, first up is Rebecca. Oh, yeah. thank you for that. Okay. So first up is uh, Dr. Rebecca Adler Miserandino who is a public health and environmental scientist with over a decade of professional experience in both academic research and international policy. As a leader of both the environment and international teams at Lewis Burke, uh, Rebecca advises scientific society and university clients to one, understand the impact of international policy issues on scientific research, two, identify international domestic policy trends, uh, and three, develop strategies to take advantage of emerging opportunities uh, that are relevant to both scientific research and sustainable development. In this role, she's been active uh, as a member of the USA's Nagoya Protocol Action Group on behalf of her clients. And from 2013 to 2020, Rebecca served as a senior advisor, foreign affairs officer, and physical scientist at the US Department of State in the Bureau of Oceans and uh, International Environmental Scientific Affairs. In this capacity, she negotiated on behalf of the United States and advised senior US officials on a variety of cross-cutting matters to advance US global environmental climate and health priorities. Uh, Rebecca, the stage is yours. All right, thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here today. Um, and thanks for that wonderful introduction. Um, so today, um, in order to understand the debate about around digital sequencing information, 
um, also known as DSI, um, it's really important to know what the, the term digital sequence information actually is, where it's being discussed, and what context, and how the scientific community can engage. Next slide. All right, next slide again. So the term digital sequence information, or DSI, is a placeholder term that's actually used in the context of the uh, UN Framework Convention on Biodiversity, sorry, the UN Convention on Biological Diversity, also referred to as the CBD. There's no consensus about the term, which is why it's used as a placeholder. And in the scientific community and among some parties to the CBD, uh, the preferred term for DSI is actually genetic sequence data. Um, which is primarily a reference to both to either DNA or RNA sequences, which are extracted from physical biological material. In contrast, uh, other countries who participate in the CBD um, take a much more expansive view of what the term digital sequence information, DSI, actually refers to, um, to not only include DNA and RNA, but to also inco incorporate amino acid sequences, protein, and other metadata that flows from the genetic sequence information itself. Importantly, the, the uh, interpretation of what DSI actually refers to is really important because it, it implies really different scopes and different legal and practical consequences to how it's interpreted, both in terms of the policy and then how it actually would be uh, realized in the context of, of uh, scientific research. Next slide. So how, is, how does the world regulate digital sequencing information and could this change? Next slide. Right now, there are a number of conversations taking place in a variety of multilateral contexts um, that could impact, uh, or that, that reference uh, access and benefit sharing. And these are, several of these are listed um, on this slide. Uh, today, as a part of this series, we're really going to be focusing on the conversations as they relate to uh, those, uh, those occurring under the Convention on Biological Diversity under its Nagoya Protocol. Um, and this is because these two instruments really are the central part of the legal regime on access and benefit sharing as it relates specifically to the topic of biodiversity conservation. Next slide. All right, so when it comes to the Convention on Biological Diversity and the Nagoya Protocol, there are three uh, aspects that are really most relevant um, to the fundamental concepts uh, that are being addressed in these contexts. Um, these are referred to as the ABCs of the Nagoya Protocol, where the A stands for access uh, to genetic resources. Um, and in this sense, um, an individual who wishes to access these resources must first get permission um, from the provider country, which is known as prior and informed consent. The B of the ABCs is for benefits, benefit sharing. Once the genetic resources are accessed, one must be able to negotiate an agreement to share the benefits resulting from the use of the genetic resource through mutually agreeable terms, which is also referred to as MAT. The C, is for compliance. All parties to the Nagoya Protocol must take appropriate measures to ensure that genetic resources are utilized with their respective, within, their, within their respective jurisdictions and that they've accessed those in accordance with the, both the PIC and the MAT. Next slide. So as it relates to those ABCs, there are a number of uh, of policy options that are under consideration um, by parties to the CBD. Um, and there is a, a large desire to be able to expand the Nagoya protocol um, access and benefit sharing from addressing just physical biological material, in other words, just like the physical specimen, to also incorporating the um, digital sequencing information in the context of the, of the access and benefit sharing mechanisms already. Um, there are a number of reasons why this is of interest to uh, to some certain parties. Um, many of the many of the parties who are interested or countries who are interested to see an expansion of the Nagoya Protocol um, see that digital sequence data or DNA RNA sequences and the whole scope of information that those are related to um, can be utilized as a loophole to benefit sharing provisions. 
So in other words, if the genetic information itself is also not included as a part of that benefit, then there, or as a part of that framework, there may be benefits that are not actually captured to the producers of that information, or to the producers of that genetic material that is lost. Um, they also, there's also a recognition that digital sequence information itself can have a potential for monetization to actually be worth real money. And so they want to ensure that there is a framework in place um, to ensure that producers are compensated for the use of that information. And third, um, there's also a desire to use an expansion of the protocol to be able to ensure that the, that the countries themselves and the access and benefit sharing mechanisms are able to actually um, compensate them in the form of growing capacity, growing domestic capacity to do the work. Importantly though, since each country develops its own policy framework under the Nagoya protocol, um, some countries have already put in place uh, mechanisms to address DSI under their existing laws. Um, and this is independent of the ongoing policy conversations. So these, uh, these conversations now that are taking place are as a way to more broadly expand the access and benefit sharing mechanisms as compared to um, you know, individual countries having already taken action under the existing framework. Next slide. All right, so although the utilization of DSA, DSI can convey benefits to all through scientific research, its use is controversial within the framework of the CBD and the Nagoya, Nagoya Protocol. Parties primarily debate things um, around two large issues. First is whether DSI is included or not in the scope of both, of both agreements, or at least within the scope of the Nagoya Protocol. In other words, this question comes down to whether or not the physical biological resources that are already addressed by the CBD and the Nagoya Protocol actually are equivalent to genetic data. The second big question is on what the implications are for possible inclusion or exclusion of DSI and what that actually would entail for the fulfillment of the agreement's objectives. Um, some parties believe that regulating DSI um, could potentially uh, actually go counter to the uh, to the uh, major objectives of the CBD, which is primarily to conserve biodiversity. So if DSI is understood to fall outside the scope of the convention and the Nagoya Protocol, the instrument would not be explicit about how DSI would be incorporated. And in that case, provider parties would not necessarily in their view benefit directly from the genetic resources once the genetic information they contain has been digitalized or stored they would still have the ability, as I said before, to create their own policy frameworks under exist under the CBD and Nagoya Protocol as it exists to handle DSI if they so chose. On the contrary, if digital sequence information is understood to be included within the scope, the convention and the Nagoya Protocol would have a series of complexities that would need to be addressed for how the access and benefit sharing regime would be expanded. So some of these questions involve uh, how to determine the origin of genetic resource uh, from which the digital sequence information actually originated. There would need to be some sort of policy in place in order to do that or standards, guidelines. Um, there also be complexities of how to monitor the use of DSI after it's collected, published, and shared. So once, once that digital sequence information is actually shared, you know, how, what would the mechanism be to actually make sure that, you know, once I read a paper and utilize a sequence that I'm now attributing um, ownership and benefits beyond my use. Um, the problem, there would also be potential challenges in determining how each individual genetic sequence actually contributed to the production of something that would be a benefit to society. Um, and there could potentially be a, a a challenge with respect to also how to actually uh, account for non-monetary benefits associated with the use of digital sequence information in the context of scientific research. Next slide. Okay, so in the context of the CBD negotiations, um, there are a diversity of positions. For the sake of simplicity of this presentation, I will discuss those in the context of two terms that are utilized in the context of the CBD, which are both provider country, which are provider countries and user countries. Um, so we'll discuss this significantly um, further down in the presentation, but for now, um, 
the view held by provider countries, which include countries like Brazil, Ecuador, Mexico, India, and South Africa, Argentina, and Ethiopia, um, see that digital sequence information is already included within the scope of the CBD and the Nagoya Protocol. And so they would suggest in the context of their negotiations that benefits generated from, from DSI utilization should be distributed between the user of the information and the country in question. To support their point, they assert that genetic resources are valuable and will be valuable because of the information they contain. Provider countries uh, reference two major tenets. First is the notion of justice that calls for the benefits of DSI to be distributed since DSI was and only could be generated in the first place because of the genetic resources, physical genetic resources that are found within their territories. The second is this notion of sovereignty. And that is that if a country is to have sovereignty over its genetic resources, it would be a contradiction if they weren't actually able to, to, have part, to take part in the benefits that arise from their utilization. The second group of countries um, that, I, that um, is often represented in the context of the CBD includes those, produce, those user countries, including Canada, the European Un Union, Japan, Australia, and Korea, which are mainly um, otherwise termed as developed countries. Um, they see a need to agree on open access and free circulation of DSI and believe that regulation should not be imposed because it would hinder access and use of DSI. The two premises that they informed their that informed their views are first the notion of freedom, the ability of scientists around the world to access DSI um, and to lead to greater scientific progress, progress. And the second is the notion of effectiveness and efficiency. If access to DSI is controlled in a way that would limit access, it could serve as a barrier to uh, to access and transparency, uh, and could limit uh, scientific research. Now some very important clarifications on these points. Number one, in reality, in this world, we are all users and to a certain extent, we're all also providers of genetic resources. So I know that we'll be discussing this significantly later. The second point is to say that I did not mention the United States at all um, as it relates to, for example, being classified with views of user countries. This is because the United States is actually not party to the CBD um, or its Nagoya protocol. However, Importantly here, I would say the policy position of the United States does very much align with those that I have termed user countries here, um, but is not officially aligned uh, or able to, to participate in the same way that other countries are because of its non-party status. Next slide. All right, so the discussions on access and benefit sharing and digital sequencing information are ongoing. Um, so decisions of parties, of, um, Decisions of parties established a science and policy based process uh, for how um, many of these issues, including this one, many issues, including this one, are actually discussed under the Convention on Biological Diversity. Um, and in 2016, began a process to actually get start getting feedback from various stakeholders uh, around this issue of digital sequencing information and its treatment under access and benefit sharing. Conversations have been occurring um, pretty much continuously since 2016. Um, with uh, several, several different negotiation steps uh, that have occurred on the road to uh, what is expected to be considered um, in uh, 2022 at COP15, where there's likely to be a decision both on the post-2020 biodiversity uh, framework, as well as some decision on digital sequencing information. Um, due to the Omicron uh, strain of COVID, it's uncertain what's actually going to be happening with respect to uh, ongoing negotiations, but we're still expecting um, for the conversation to occur in some way, shape, or form over the next several months. Next slide. So, um, the most important part of our workshop series, I think, is thinking about how scientists really can be approaching the digital sequencing information issue and understanding the impacts on overall research. Um, on this, I would just say, you know, from, from the scientists, it's really important to be able to take every opportunity you can to explain your views and your point in, in your thoughts on how uh, potential regulation of digital sequencing information can actually be utilized. Um, and to try to understand the viewpoints behind um, different positions 
uh, so that we're able to better as a scientific community uh, align our interests and make cogent arguments to those who are in the position of, of um, authority on decisions. Um, so to this end, you know, if, those, if we have views, it's really important to actually address peers both from developing and developed countries, and also to be very clear in reasoning and um, articulating your views. Uh, and so in this sense, um, there are some messages that may be very uh, helpful. Um, first is just to recognize that there's a value to both monetary and non-monetary benefits of the use of DSI. Um, and that the scientific community may very well have a way of identifying aspects, scientific practices, database policies, how to actually trace data and how to build capacity um, in, in internet, with international collaborators, including in developing countries. So with that, I think I am ready to hand it over to the next speaker. Thank you, Rebecca. This is Ed. And uh, that was a, a terrific distillation of uh, enormously complicated uh, um, history um, and, uh, and useful recommendations for scientists everywhere to consider. Uh, our next presentation will come from Agustin Fuentes, who is a professor of anthropology at Princeton University. His work focuses on the biosocial uh, delving into entanglements of biological systems with the social and cultural lives of humans, our ancestors, and a few other animals with whom humanity shares close relations. Uh, from chasing monkeys in jungles and cities to exploring our lives, uh, lives of our evolutionary ancestors, to examining health, behavior, diversity across the globe, uh, Professor Fuentes is interested in both the big questions and the small details of what makes humans and our close relations tick. He received his bachelor's degrees in anthropology and zoology and his uh, master's and PhD in anthropology, all from University of California, Berkeley, and has conducted research across four continents, multiple species, two million years of human history. His current projects include foci on human evolution, multi-species anthropologies, evolutionary theory, uh, and theory and practice in the use of genetic data. And as you can see, he will be uh, speaking about uh, the center and periphery. So with that, I give you Augustine. Thank you so much uh, for the introduction. And I wanna thank the AIBS, the AAA and the ASP for facilitating this workshop. Um, don't have much time, so let's uh, jump right in. What I'd like to do is to sort of take uh, what we've just been thinking through the CBD and the sort of BSI context, and, and I want to frame it as my title uh, does here, uh, in sort of collaboration and benefit sharing, but, but I put inequity in the front there because I think the issues of inequity, which I'm going to frame as a center periphery discourse, uh, are central in this kind of discussion. Next. So there are big questions and go ahead and click twice to get the two things up there. Um, the two examples I'm gonna be using here uh, to think about sort of my big questions of my four that set the stage for my relationship with DSI are a long-term project with a, a species macaque circularis, uh, long-tailed monkeys. And you can hit uh, three more times to put some images up there, thank you. Um, long-tailed macaques, macaque circularis at the human macaque interface sort of looking at the relationships, the distribution of this primate species across the planet and its relation with that other particular primate humans and how they overlap and co-shape one another. Uh, and then the second example comes from my long-term work on sort of the relationship between bodies, behavior, and DNA, particularly in the context of biodiversity and especially in the context of past human populations. Next. Um, the two sort of goals, objectives of these large multi-decade projects that I've been involved in are for the macaque project is looking at macaque distribu distribution and diversity. Uh, the long-tailed macaque, macaque of Sucularis, is one of the most widespread primate species, aside from uh, a few other macaques, uh, some baboons and humans, um, to look at also human and macaque overlap and to understand the co-construction of ecologies, in particular in that overlap, to also focus uh, on the interspecific pathogen exchange network. So that's in the macaque project. 
Um, and you can already see where DSI is going to play a role there. The human project is looking at evolutionary history, sort of past and present biodiversity again, uh, biocultural processes, and uh, obviously uh, genomic information, uh, particularly ancient DNA, plays a central role in structuring that sort of interpretive zone for all of those things. But also as part of the human project, I'm, I'm particularly interested in how we think about who narrates the past, who then utilizes these data to create narratives and stories about human history. Next, please. The project geography, geographies that I'm gonna describe here are just two subsets. There's actually many, many more uh, nations, uh, uh, geographic regions and collaborators involved in these projects. But the focus point uh, that I'm gonna make here is on one sort of macaque field-based project involving multiple um, universities, the United States, Guam and Indonesia, uh, and, and uh, the um, uh, member of the government uh, of Singapore, the National Parks Board. Uh, and then in the human, uh, and I'm just going to be very, very focused on, on one series of events that has to do with uh, thinking through existing data sets in DSI plus the extraction of genetic materials. And this was specifically around the presentation debates and discussions around ancient DNA. And this involved uh, my colleagues uh, in, in, in Mexico at the National Museum of Anthropology, the School of Anthropology and History in the National University, uh, plus some major uh, ADNA uh, researchers uh, from the United States and Europe. Um, and importantly, and I want to have a few moments to talk about this, it involved funding from the National Geographic and John Templeton Foundations, uh, and the funding plays, I think, an important role that we sometimes overlook in discussions about DSI. Next. Um, uh, two clicks. The different types of digital uh, sequence data or genetic sequence data, really, in the macaque project, we're very specifically thinking about genetic material from macaques, actually a little from humans, and then broader biological samples um, that include saliva, blood, tissue samples, and a variety of other things, uh, most of which uh, has been digitized and is now circulating. On the human uh, context, we can think about paleoanthropological materials that are osteological in shape and structure and content, but also very specific the extraction and destruction of those osteological materials in order to develop uh, access to, to DNA sequence information, which then may or may not become digitized. Next. So this is a confusing graph, and I want to start here. This is just uh, to frame a little bit of the debate and discussion. This is uh, part of a National Science Foundation funded project um, between the late 1990s through the uh, uh, first decade of the 2000s um, with a number of the collaborators that I pointed out. This is an example of what working with DSI, and here I'm just actually focusing on the genetic sequence information and subsequent digitization, uh, what, what that looks like. And I just wanna walk you through that just briefly as a, as a stage setter here. That is, there was the original project and proposal permits between uh, colleagues uh, on the original team, uh, mostly from North American institutions and uh, universities in Indonesia, plus the Indonesian government infrastructure uh, research, which at the time was LIPA and today's RISTEC, uh, um, and some Indonesian universities. So once that proposal was put together, which included the uh, collection, analysis, and publication of genetic sequence information, it then sort of the proposal was uh, uh, put forward and, and, and sanctioned. sanctioned permits were made, and then we had the first original field projects. And to think about those field projects, that is to think about the digital sequence information, which was initially genetic sequence data, we had to think about our connections between the actual researchers, the domestic collaborators, the domestic sponsors of that research, the international sponsors, the local partners, the uh, international partners, the students, because in this case, there were a number of students, uh, graduate and undergraduate participating in this research project, and the plethora of layers of regional and local permits. So all of these components were actually central structuring elements prior to the initial access of any of the sequence data, which would then turn into potentially digital information. So these multiple layers have to always be considered. And importantly, and I think this is, is really, really worth saying and mentioning again and again, it's that these are international collaborative efforts. Um, then we begin the collections and the collections there, and here I'll just focus on the macaques, the collections involve uh, safety, uh, harms and risks, uh, the idea of collecting biological material, particularly blood or uh, saliva, uh, even feces, uh, where you're not directly collecting from the individual. Um, all of these things can uh, carry a number of safeties, harms and risks and involved in an, an enormous amount of preparation 
uh, on the part of the research team uh, to engage with that. Storage then becomes a central component and storage locally, regionally, and internationally become important uh, if they're uh, exported. Uh, and, and finally, the sort of structuring of the collection such that it resonates or is in conjunction with the interests of the domestic collaborators and the local partners uh, and is part of their overall project and their interests as well. All of these things have to take place first before you can actually have the uh, biological material from which you extract genetic sequences. Then once those sequences are extracted, you enter the zone of complexity of what do you do with them? Do you analyze them in situ, that is uh, in the exact local destination? Do you examine them regionally at other institutions within the country where you've derived them? Or are they extracted internationally? Uh, and that involves a whole multiple levels of permits and structuring components like that, which I'm going to come back to. Then once you've satisfied all of that, then you can do the analysis and, and dissemination. Um, and if I can just get the next slide, I'm not even going to go through the entire uh, complexities involved with that. Let me just cut to the chase here and say uh, we did all of that. Uh, and, and it has resulted in a number of publications. Here's just a very, very small sample. The bottom line being is that we went through all of these processes and the end result is incredible dissemination of a wide scale of, of analyses and digital sequence information. Next slide. However, um, one of the major things that cut this project short at the end of the first decade of the 2000s was that disagreements emerged between international, local, and national collaborators in Indonesia, right? where the actual extraction and collection and research was uh, undergoing. And these disagreements because of differential agendas, because of differential legal structures, because of differential interpretations of what these projects should do and produce and how the DSI, the genetic sequences and their digital analyzed outcomes should be deployed and used. Those disagreements were at the end of the day enough to stop the project. And I'm gonna stop here and move on to the next one, but let me just say, those disagreements and the decisions to stop the project, which as director of the project was my decision, um, was in direct response to the fact that the interests of multiple international, national, and local constituents, partitioner, participants, and collaborators on this project no longer matched up. And at that point, uh, the decision was made to stop the project. Next slide. In the example of the human evolution uh, uh, context, uh, specifically around the ADNA, I want to focus just on one teeny part of it, but a very salient part of it. And that was an attempt uh, that was initiated, in fact, by the National Geographic uh, Foundation and facilitated by the John Templeton Foundation and by researchers in Mexico itself, uh, by Mexican scholars and scientists focused on this topic to bring together a number of major uh, organizations, research labs, and individuals who are participating in the analysis of a very important for humans uh, DSI content, that is ancient DNA, and to bring them together and to have a conversation about these differential collaborations, conflicts, context. This uh, um, gathering happened. Uh, I, I was the moderator for one of the events. And what happened from this first gathering was sort of a number of informal agreements, uh, the publication or presentation of a white paper, and, and a number of future plans. However, none of this really patterned out in the way that it was hoped for. Uh, many of the centers, the sort of larger labs, larger prominent individuals sort of took this experience and sort of moved on bringing some of what we're going to call the periphery, which I'll come back to in a moment, participants into their decision making, into their collaboration, but leaving many others and many main things out. The real conflicts here ended up being issues about the pace of work, the infrastructure, the financial, cultural objectives, and other differences between what I'm going to define in a moment here as the center and the periphery labs. Next slide. The white paper that came out of it was, was quite good and laid out a number of starting points. However, it did not really do much. Next slide. Not much changed. Next slide. And that's because, oh, let me just give you an example of how not much changed uh, very recently in Nature. And this has been going on for now two years since these meetings. Uh, uh, recently in Nature, a number of, of scholars from around the world got together to publish a sort of uh, uh, what should have been a hallmark paper on the ethics of DNA research in human reigns, five globally applicable guidelines. Uh, and if you look at those five guidelines, each one starts with researchers must, 
And there were two very important letters uh, by multiple scholars written uh, to this Nature article, pointing out that the entire control and decision-making around ancient DNA, around DSI associated with ancient DNA, cannot exclusively belong to the researchers. And here's why. Next slide. Um, oh, uh, let me just acknowledge that a lot of the work that I'm going to be summarizing here and talking about uh, is, is heavely influenced by the Summer Internship for Indigenous Peoples and Genomics and a number of the collaborators in that project who are way in front and have been for many years uh, on this topic. And I highly encourage people thinking about any work with human genomics to engage with those scholars. Next slide. So uh, I would like to present the center and periphery and sort of as a concluding frame here. Uh, next. Um, the center and periphery as a frame when thinking about DSI is one, it's an ecosystem. Let us think about sort of use of DSI as an ecosystem that reproduces geopolitical and economic asymmetries within science, which in turn opens the possibility for thinking from an ethical and epistemologic perspective about the economic and power differentials and imbalances in these asymmetric relationships. Next. There are centers and peripheries. The centers are the main laboratories, the researchers and funding. This is what we primarily call the global north and what has been referred to in the CBD as, as users uh, and the scientists on the periphery of power, the scientists, the researchers on the periphery of power, but centrally located at the source of the data, uh, unfortunately called users uh, in CBD, uh, which are largely the global power south. So I think center and periphery office or something. Next slide. Um, and this is not to imply that the big laboratories and funding agencies are the only substantive forces driving scientific inquiry. Often the periphery drives the best questions. However, there are incredible power imbalances at play. Next slide. So I here I'm drawing on uh, my colleagues and I, Juan Manuel Aguayas and Bernardo Llanes, and our article that's forthcoming to just imagine, if you will, for a moment, when thinking about the frame of DSI, to think about the center and here the global north, global south uh, sort of geospatial morphology that I placed here is on purpose. That is, the centers are positions of financial and infrastructural power. The periphery are those researchers and scholars in the areas where much of the genetic sequence data is produced, right? Who have many scholarly and intellectually robust questions about this engagement, but do not have the same kind of funding or infrastructural power that the centers have. And it is this dichotomy, this difference between center and periphery that should be the beginning of our discussions, whether this is talking about, you know, studying macaque DNA or whether it's talking about human ancient DNA, the relationships globally of power asymmetries and structures are absolutely central. Next slide. So here I ask, qui fit, qui bono? Uh, click on that to show us it's all about access and benefits. Um, you can, one more click, please, just to put up the English. Um, the, the bottom line here is that all science is political and economic. The infrastructural inequity between scientific possibilities and the centers and the peripheries globally today are incredibly important in any conversation about DSI that is thinking about this frame and moving forward in this frame to think about the narratives, the relationships, the benefits and access and how we structure those should begin and end with a notion about restructuring the ecosystem. Next slide. I would like to leave us with just the thinking that we can restructure the ecology of center periphery and that the role of DSI is an opening. The CBD provides us an opportunity to think through biodiversity, to think through equity in ways that alter infrastructural and power differentials and possibilities in the engagement in this kind of research. And I would like to suggest that my experiences in the two that I just outlined very briefly here offer some possibilities for thinking through these complexities as a starting point. Complexity is a starting point and hopefully our ending point is a restructuring of the ecosystem for more equity and a reduced inequality between center and periphery in regards to access, use, and benefit sharing from DSI. Thank you very much. Thank you, Augustine. This is Ed again. And, uh, and I think if there's one thing I'll take away from your talk, it is this reinforcement of the idea that Science is indeed socially situated, an inescapable fact of our work. Um, next, we're going to hear from Dr. Cheryl Makarovich, who is a professor of zooarchaeology and stable isotope biogeochemistry at Kiel University in Germany. 
Her research investigates the transition from hunting gathering to food production, ancient animal husbandry practices, and human animal interactions in the Near East and the Eurasian steppe uh, through integrated, multi-stable, isotopic, proteomic, and genomic analyses of calcified tissues and residues deposited on ceramics. She also directs several archeological excavations in Jordan, including uh, research at the pre-pottery Neolithic sites of El Heme, Shahara, and Beda. She's currently leading a European Research Council funded project, Asia Past, which explores the spread of mobile pastoralism across ancient Eurasian steppe and how this process altered human diets, changed the ways people moved across landscapes and generated entirely new forms of socio-political organization, an interesting subset of evidence to be included here. Uh, Cheryl? Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, it's wonderful to speak everyone today um, about these um, very important, obviously very, very timely uh, projects. Um, I'm gonna build upon a little bit and expand um, on some of the topics that Augustine has just uh, touched upon. Um, as you may have gathered, um, I'm an archeologist and so I'm primarily interested in the um, origins of food production and in, with a particular interest in uh, uh, animal domestication processes. So thinking about the Nagoya protocol um, and is, is extremely important to the work that we're doing, especially now as these new sort of analytical approaches, including ancient genomics are becoming uh, more and more important now in our fields, not only for ancient uh, humans, but also for ancient animals. Uh, next slide, please. So, you know, we're talking about what's the big questions here for, for some of the work that I'm doing. And, and it's no less than really thinking about how did shifts in the human animal relationship really shape ancient subsistence society and also symbolic systems. And so some of the examples that I'll be referring to a little bit today are, for example, the animal domestication processes in the Near East. And this, uh, you know, this uh, dynamic process was underway about 12,000 years ago um, in what's today um, the, the Levant and uh, uh, Southeast uh, Anatolia up through the Zagros regions. And we are building now on decades of zooarchaeological research that has revealed lots of information on how um, animal harvesting and intensification and hunting practices, um, as well as uh, shifts in uh, local climates and, and so on and so forth, influence that sort of uh, human resource availability, uh, the, the resources that were, they were accessing, and how that brought them closer to particular ungulate species um, on the landscape. So we'll be talking a bit about that today. And the other kind of things that we're thinking about as well when we're thinking about this human animal relationship is the spread of pastoralism across the Eurasian steppe. So once we have domesticated animals um, sort of emerge in the Near East around again, uh, you know, several uh, thousand millennia ago around 10,000 BC or so, um, we start having animals pushing out um, very slowly out of that so-called core. And we have something absolutely fantastic going on um, about you know, 4,000 years ago or so, depending on your particular time scale, where you start getting bobbed livestock pushing out across the steppe and entirely new life ways are being constructed around these in this new kind of environment and these new kinds of animals, these new kinds of technologies. So that's something that we can really start exploring um, using some of these um, uh, different kinds of analytical approaches that we're gonna talk about in a second. Um, other examples um, that we won't get in so much um, to uh, talk about today, but I think it's very important, and very timely given the current um, pandemic situation, of course, is also zoonotic diseases. So ancient pathogen genomics really offer a very powerful means to investigate how diseases shape um, ancient livestock population structures. And it's important to keep in mind that agro-pastoralists and pastoralist communities, they're mobile. And that means their livestock is really a significant vector for the propagation of infectious diseases. And we know that the extent and duration and transmission of zoonotic diseases is really tightly linked to um, livestock population densities and also contact networks. And so we're interested in, as archeologists in particular in diseases, animal diseases that were characterized by high morbidity, including foot and mouth disease, um, hemorrhagic septicemia and tuberculosis and also brucellosis. Uh, next slide, please. 
Right, so the question is, um, how can archeological data sets inform on current challenges? And, and what I wanna do is actually take a step back because we're thinking and talking tonight about genomics specifically and ancient livestock genomics, which is directly underneath the Nagoya protocol. But genomics does not stand by itself within this world, within this archeological world, okay? It's just one of the many approaches that's being used to address human animal relationships in the past. So we're getting different types of information from different kinds of analytical approaches. So we have zooarchaeology, so which I would argue is kind of the foundation of all other work because it provides you with a pile of bones um, that is extracted from the archaeological record, upon which you can then um, conduct stable isotopic analysis, um, proteomic analyses, and also genomic analyses. And again, these give you different types of information, okay? And I think it's important to emphasize this. Our zooarchaeology is going to give us information on slaughtering patterns, on herd demography, on production goals, even on ritual behaviors. Our stable isotopes are going to tell you about scales of animal ability, about their dietary intake, um, about birth seasonality. Um, proteomics can give us um, some more additional levels of taxonomic resolution, and it's also starting to provide some very promising work on the diseases, um, and, um, diseases that we're just talking about right now. And again, it's very important to situate the genomic work within this kind of um, context because it is not alone. Genomics is not the only way to think about the human animal relationship in the past. And it is very much worth emphasizing because at least in the world of archeology, span ancient genomics, it's, it's a very sexy topic. It's a very powerful approach. And some of these other techniques can get swept under the rug, so to speak. These all give us different temporal and spatial scales of resolutions. So how can these archeological data sets actually inform on our current challenges today? What's important is that all of these approaches, including genomics, they really are providing us some key information on diversity, okay? This diversity that's being revealed by these approaches becomes all the more important on our really increasingly homogenized livestock pool, which have been really bred or even engineered for hyper production of mass quantities of meat and milk. And we're all familiar now with these sort of industrialized farming that we're witnessing today. And this is resulting in a loss of uh, genetic diversity. So we're getting these kind of livestock monocultures. So we're having uh, animals that are highly susceptible to industrialize, uh, uh, industrial livestock to disease. Um, it's now being countered with antibiotics, which it sort of engenders its own set of problems of parasites, also the climate change. We're also getting sort of a loss of cuisine. We're getting a homogenization of taste. We're, you know, all these kinds of the, these things are just becoming more and more the same. But with these kinds of different approaches, we are starting to understand the diversity and really kind of um, rediscover the diversity of various kinds of uh, aspects of the human animal relationship that have very important implications for today. Next slide, please. So um, I'm gonna talk about two uh, projects that I'm uh, involved with, which is of course Near Eastern Animal Domestication using many of those approaches that I just uh, discussed now. And we're really interested here in that initial human experimentation with husbandry. What did it take for humans to start messing around with animals that were on the landscape? Was it climate change? Was it resource stress? Was it niche construction? Was it something else? And all these approaches are really starting to reveal um, quite a few different pathways into this, including genomics. Um, one of the big questions that has sort of confounded us, is this a single uh, center of domestication or is it a very dispersed process? Now, this is uh, a question that has sort of eluded, I would say, tr more traditional zooarchaeological approaches for decades. We've gotten, I think, a very good workable models. Um, but now the genomic situation is starting to provide a lot new, of new information on this. And the other thing we wanna keep in mind, again, we're thinking about as archeologists here, so we wanna think holistically about our genomic data sets, is how do these um, selective pressures that may result, that resulted in domesticated animals, how do they articulate with other subsistence innovations and also social dynamics? The other project that I'm, I'm currently running is called the Asia Pasture Project. And this, again, is looking at uh, the spread of uh, pastoralism across the Eurasian steppe. And I think this, this project kind of tackles this really fascinating idea is how, what, you know, how do you get 
this weird and wonderful brand new technology of livestock domesticates, particularly sheep, goat, and cattle. How do you bring them across these vast open spaces um, or up and, uh, up and down mountain, you know, quite hostile mountain uh, ranges and so on and so forth. And how does that become, um, these animal technology, how do they become sort of taken up? How do they become uh, canalized in certain societies in some cases and how do they become maybe discarded in others? So we're specifically looking at translocation pathways of domesticates across Eurasian steppe, and we're, we are tackling that um, using genomic approaches. And we're also, again, looking at the population histories of, of these particular livestock. Um, we want to take a look at how um, these kinds of um, shifts in the movements of uh, animals coincided or didn't uh, with uh, exchange networks for, say, metals, for example, or uh, shifts in human populations, which the ancient, uh, ancient uh, genomic, human genomic record has revealed. And we also want to take a look at the selection for specific e economic traits in these animals. Do we get woolier sheep? Do we get uh, animals that are yielding higher fat milk? And so on and so forth. So I think these are really kind of really interesting things that we can start really kind of tackling in our ancient uh, situation using kind of genomic approaches supported by other ones as well. And I think this work that um, I'm involved with here also touches upon this idea of how is these stories written and also who writes it. All right, next slide, please. Um, so the project geographies for uh, these projects are quite um, diverse. Um, in the Near Eastern Animal Domestication Projects, they are field-based and they're lab-based. So because the, there's a really explicit design here where we're trying to join together um, all these kinds of data sets, including archae archeological data sets, as well as genomic and stable isotopic and zooarchaeological and paleobotanical and so on and so forth, um, we really have start our, our work in the field. Um, so uh, we have multiple teams in Jordan and also Israel, for example. The Asia Pass project is quite expansive. Um, so we have lots and lots of collaborators, all from Russia, from Mongolia, from Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan. And all together, these two projects sort of emphasize um, a point that was brought up earlier is sort of the diversity of, of approaches that different countries take in terms of um, access and benefit sharing, um, adherence to the Nagoya Protocol, um, as well as the, uh, the, individual, the, the, the individual sort of uh, desires for how projects should go and also national strategies for um, to particular projects and where genetic and other even archeological data uh, should go. Uh, next slide, please. So we're talking, you know, largely about DSI, but I think it's also important to kind of come back to the source material, okay? So for these projects, um, our source material is, you know, sheep and goat skeletal material in this case, um, back to that pile of bones. So these are collected from faunal assemblages. And while one may target different skeletal elements, the, the, the gold standard is the petrous bone, those things that look like stones um, at the top of your slide there. And that has been demonstrated to offer outstanding DNA uh, preservation in ancient burial environments. Now, the pile of bones, there's lots of those relatively speaking, but the petrous bones are relatively rare. Um, and we're gonna come back to that point in a second. The other point that I want to kind of bring up here is that when you're collecting or um, you know going out uh, gathering different specimens, source specimens, is that you also have to collect your archaeological context information. We cannot do this work devoid of that context information. It's much in the same that you would conduct um, any sort of ecological or biological study. You have that context. You have that information surrounding uh, your source specimens. Next slide, please. So. Again, accessing material, it's, it's, it's a variable situation. If you are lucky, your access, when you go to collect your source specimens, you will encounter a situation like this. Uh, this is the Museum of London where everything is not only very nicely organized in wonderful boxes where everything is clearly labeled. Many of these things now have barcodes so you, or uh, QR codes uh, where you can just zap it and it tells you what's inside the box so you don't have to open everything up and rummage around in it. Next slide, please. 
Or you have um, sort of uh, situations like this. Um, on the left side, this is actually, I would say, not so bad. Um, we've got some topsy-turvy boxes. Uh, they don't look like they're labeled on the outside, or they might be, but there's some lids missing, and there's some stuff kind of piled around, and it looks like it's in a, you know, a room that may or may not be secure, hard to say. In our middle slide, we have uh, open sort of wobbly-looking crates with a bunch of plastic bags chucked in. Um, I would argue that that's actually not the worst I've ever seen, um, but that's not exactly accessible for um, individuals um, without uh, not only spending lots of time going through the material, but also possibly damaging other material that's stored in those boxes. And then we have unfortunately other situations, um, like for example, in the Idlib Museum in Syria, where there was um, quite a bit of material, not only um, sort of cultural, mater cultural uh, material culture, like ceramics and so on and so forth, but also, um, for example, animal bones and human material as, as well, which was all um, destroyed and looted out um, during that war. So we have a curation crisis here. Um, there is not enough space for all of this material on um, which later genomic and other archeological scientific um, approaches are sort of carried out on. There are certainly um, not temperature controlled rooms or freezer that are required for the best preservation of ancient DNA, for example. Um, this is a major problem, especially in regions of the world where you have ex uh, temperature extremes and buildings that are not very uh, well insulated and so on and so forth. And we have questions also with when you get into situations where things are not stored particularly well, you lose information. So we have actually these weird legacy collections where the contextual information, the labels and so on and so forth that actually identify these bones are actually very poorly preserved themselves or they're actually lost. So when we think about digital sequence uh, information storage, we actually also have to think about curation of those source specimens. I think it's really, really important. Our rush to sort of get at the, these ancient genomes, we're kind of forgetting about the resource itself, okay? And we need to think, you know, not just about select bones like the Petrus bone, that's sort of the gold mine one, but the skeletal remains, which all skeletal remains, which all may preserve ancient DNA and other information as well. The methods change, and also importantly, the research questions change. Next question, uh, next slide, please. So I just want to run you very quickly about um, through this uh, flow chart here about how do you actually access um, samples for um, ancient genomic analyses. Um, it's, it's relatively almost simple looking compared, compared to the, the previous slides that um, Augustine was showing previously. So we have our field work. Um, if you're starting from the field work side of things, you, of course, you assemble your team and you write a proposal and you submit that proposal to the uh, appropriate authorities who then decide whether or not your proposal is good enough and issue a permit. You have your excavation. You recover your fauna. Um, it's important to note that the recovery of um, ancient uh, Faunal remains is dependent highly on not, of course, only on the burial conditions, but also faunal recovery. And so um, our access to that source specimens is actually dictated from the very get-go in the field by the decisions that excavators make on one, what to, how they're going to dig, how they're going to uh, retrieve materials. Are they going to sieve? Are they going to sieve using a screen? Are they going to water sieve? Um, or are they just going to kind of throw things in a bucket and uh, you know, leave things aside? Luckily, that those days are, I think, long over. Then um, most of that material should be um, uh, sub then subjected to zooarchaeological analyses, after which um, it will go into storage. Um, if there are no zooarchaeological zoo analyses conducted, uh, then it will just simply go uh, into storage after the fallen recovery stage. So then you can make a decision whether or not to acquire export permits. Now, if you are, say, for example, a genomics analyst, um, you probably aren't going to be involved in the field work side of things. So you are going, your, your, uh, your next step, it depends on a country, uh, the country that you're working in. And I'm just going to speak briefly about Jordan because that's where I've conducted um, quite a bit of my work. You simply go and you talk to the excavator, you talk to the PI, and you say, I have an idea and I would like to pursue it. And it's up to the excavator uh, or the, not the, 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 the PI of the excavation to grant you um, permission for the samples, okay? If you are granted position, uh, permission by the PI, you can then um, go to the storage room um, and um, access the material. This material is stored, stored in, in universities. It's stored in foreign missions. For example, the British Institute, the German Institute, the French Institute, um, pick your Northern global power of choice, um, or the department into restore room. Then you go to apply for your export permits. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> 
this is a sort of surprisingly loose process. So um, this is just an example of a list on your, uh, I believe on the left-hand side of your screen. Um, and all you have, all you are doing here is you're listing the locus or the context number of, from where the material came from. Maybe if you assigned a sample number um, to uh, the bag or the bone or the box, it's not clear what that is. Um, and that's fairly typical. Um, you then bring it to the Department of Antiquities and they take a quick look and then they grant you uh, permission to export that from the country. Um, in, in many places like Jordan, you are granted a long-term loan. What does that mean? It means they basically, they would prefer not to see it return because of those storage issues, okay? Now this is a problem in itself because it's actually now depleting uh, the, the, the cultural heritage of that particular country for lack of storage. Uh, next slide, please. And so you get your export permits and you conduct your analyses and then you send your written report to the DOA and then you disseminate. So it's fairly straightforward, um, on, in some ways, slightly troublingly so. Um, in some ways, one might wish for more oversight on this, especially if we're starting to think again about Nagoya Protocol and benefit sharing. Next slide, please. So um, in Jordan, for example, um, the Nagoya Protocol was implemented in 2012. Um, it's not broadcast, for example, by the Department of Ant Antiquities. They probably aren't particularly well aware of it. Archaeologists certainly are not aware of it. And, and that their obligations, if they're sampling from uh, ancient faunal remains for the genomic work of the obligations that they have. And there's certainly no discussion whatsoever of uh, DSI management uh, at all. Now, I think it is important to, to, to discuss though, or point out that there are ongoing discussions about how to manage material, cultural and other data types. So it's not like it's a lost cause here. There is experience and there is the groundwork laid down to think, to, to actually, curate uh, cultural material and also uh, data types that are such as settlement data, such as photo uh, photographs. And, and now we're starting to get some kind of uh, archiving of other kinds of archeological data. So the groundwork is there, but there's a very, very long way to go. And much of that has to do with basic communication about what are the obligations. Next slide, please. So just very briefly, outcomes and challenges, where do we go from here? Um, this is just a quick picture. Um, one of our epic hike to one of our excavations uh, in Jordan. Next slide, please. So, um, a lot of ancient livestock genomics is really kind of picking up. Okay, so there's been lots and lots of work done in ancient human DNA over the past, you know, five years in particular. It's really, really ramped up. Uh, for the situation for ancient animal remains, it's it's starting, it's happening. We're starting to get some very, very cool data that's coming out. Um, and it's really kind of transforming in some ways how we understand the animal domestication process. And it's now also revealing um, how different domesticates spread across different um, landscapes, landforms, for example, like the Eurasian steppe. So it's a very, very exciting time, especially when you're trying to couple these data with other um, archaeological uh, scientific data sets. Next slide, please. However, we have some very important challenges that we need to address. Um, <laughs> I think uh, ancient livestock genomics is probably headed in the same direction um, that Augustine alluded to with human, uh, ancient human remains, um, is that there is competition, hot competition for these samples, okay? Especially for that also precious uh, petrous bone. There's uh, lots of uh, kind of uh, people going in, really looking for material very quickly. There's arguably hoarding, there's uh, uh, the domination by a few labs. And it's basically what it's doing at the end of the day is impoverishing the cultural and genetic heritage of the country not supported by costly laboratory infrastructure. And this is a real problem. Uh, next slide, please. And we have to remember, it's a limited resource, okay? These faunal remains, as the case is human, ancient human remains, is that they are, there are not, you know, an endless supply of this stuff, especially for these, again, these petrous bones, um, which there's relatively few, which have the highest uh, amount of genetic preservation in them, especially in regions of the world, like the Middle East, for example, where um, preservation tends to be very poor because of the, um, the high temperatures um, and, and burial environments. Next slide, please. 
And the other challenge that we have to think about here too is when we're talking about ancient genomic work, again, whether we're talking about livestock work or um, uh, humans, is, is uh, human ancient uh, work, is the asymmetry and the pace of the science that's being done. Okay, so archaeology tends to be slow. Okay, so you're, you're, the, the pace of work in the field takes a long time. To, to get that one Petrus bone, it might take a year or two to actually retrieve that amongst all the other things you have to do. Whereas I, you know, understandably at the same time, the pace in the laboratory, it's relatively slow, but not compared to archeology. span It's much, much, much faster. And especially um, in this more industrialized sort of landscape of some of these bigger labs now, it's really, really ramping up. And the other asymmetry there is these often very strong disagreements in the interpretation between archaeologists and um, uh, ancient genomic practitioners that are, have emerged and have been a source of great controversy. Next slide, please. So I just want to very briefly say, you know, how do these ancient genomic interpretations fit with archaeological data and theoretical frameworks? It's a really important issue, okay? Um, there's been an argument that this ancient genomic work um, is part of a third science revolution and that this is going to give us all the answers along with um, some kinds of uh, isotope analysis. On, uh, next slide, please. But there's been a very, very strong, strong pushback. Uh, against us within the archaeological community. Um, it has to do with sort of uh, a loss of, uh, I don't want to say control over the narrative, but very deep concerns and very well compounded concerns that the genomic data is kind of superseding all other kinds of archaeological data where there have been decades and decades of, of rigorous research, often um, hypothesis-based um, testing models, um, and that's being discarded in, the fa in favor of these kinds of uh, uh, so uh, genomic analyses. And there's been a lot of discussion on this, lots of um, ink spill on this recently. Uh, there's been a, a kind of a nice discussion we had uh, a few months ago here in uh, the EAAs from critique to synthesis transcending the genomic divide within archaeology run by myself and Mark Foho and uh, uh, Asaf Nativ and that brought together um, archaeologists and, and ancient genomic practitioners together to try to really um, get past a lot of this and, and come up with something new and a better way forward. Uh, next slide, please. Finally, I think when we're talking about Nagoya Protocol and benefit sharing, we have to talk about modern geopolitics and identities and claims to place in technologies, okay? When we're thinking about genetic resources, ancient or otherwise, they could be politically contested source specimens, okay? And therefore the DSI could also be politically contested. Um, archaeology and nationalism, uh, they have a lot of close links um, and you know, um, and there are many, many instances where uh, various regimes around the world have referred to the archaeological record as a way to validate and legitimize uh, their own actions and their own place in the world. Um, and, you know, so that, that kind of that kind of groundwork is there and, and it started transfer now, I think, to some of this genomic work as well. And, you know, for example, um, if we're talking about the animal domestication process, this is, a, you know, the Near East, all right, it is a, a complex political area to say the least, okay? So, for example, when we're talking about the Oslo Accords and um, archaeological sites, so we have these, you know, for example, in the Palestinian situation, we have this unresolved political status it's combined with a very uh, with a very complex legislative landscape that includes these colonial colonial legacies, uh, including the Ottomans, the British Mandate, uh, Jordanians, Egyptians, and also uh, Israeli military contracts. And it means that archaeological sites and archaeological objects and materials, including ancient animal remains, have a convoluted oversight at best. And while the focus has been on material cultures and who they belong to and who owns them, and what about those ancient genomic animal specimens, where, as someone mentioned before, is that there is information in there that is potentially, could be potentially monetized. These animals themselves, ancient art technologies. Uh, I think that next is my second to last slide, please. I think it's also important, our biggest challenge too, is really integrating the current and next generation of genomic and also other archaeological scientific practitioners from underfunded countries. Um, this is really um, important uh, to really move forward on this in a very meaningful way. There's been a lot of lip service paid to them, but there's yet to be any meaningful action. And we also have to ensure dissemination to local communities and also DSI serving um, to local stakeholders. 
Um, there are very deep cultural benefits that could be uh, dispersed with um, when we're starting to think, getting results and thinking about results that we get from ancient livestock genomic analyses, but and, and not only cultural ones, but also economic ones as well. So next slide and thank you very much. Thank you, Cheryl. This is Ed again. Uh, and, and I'm just uh, uh, really excited about both the, the important research on these big questions about diversity and, and resilience, as well as the access and benefit sharing challenges that you raise there. Our, our final formal presentation will be from Dr. Karen Miga, who is with the Biomolecular Bio Engineering Department at the University of California, Santa Cruz. And she is currently that university's director of the Human Pan Genome Reference Consortium, uh, which is funded by the National Human Genome Research Institute. It's an initiative that's designed to release a human pan genome reference constructed from more than 350 individuals representing highly diverse ethnic backgrounds to serve as a foundation for future biomedical and genomic medicine research. This effort falls in step with the legacy of the Human Genome Project in terms of once again, relying on a big science international production that requires working groups of multidisciplinary experts, including leading computational biologists, genomic technologists, population geneticists, and ethicists who can guide the project's approach to community engagement and sampling. Uh, Dr. Mika currently works to establish an international pan genome project. Uh, this work is aligned with the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, which is a policy framing and technical standard setting organization seeking to enable responsible genomic data sharing with the human rights framework. Karen, stage is yours. Thank you very much. And thank you for including me in this workshop. Um, I'm gonna be talking about a specific digital sequence information and this is the reference genome. Um, in particular, I'm gonna focus on the human reference genome, if you don't mind, next slide. However, I'm hoping to convince you that today that there are a lot of commonalities with what my um, new friends and colleagues have presented before me in terms of um, benefit sharing, um, asymmetries, and how we en enable data sharing internationally. Now, when we start to think about the human reference genome, this may be a celebration of an international collaborative research project where it started about 30 years ago and we all celebrated the release of, uh, you know, of the final human genome project in, back in 2000. Um, next slide, please. And I think it's fair to say that the human reference genome doesn't belong to any one country. In particular, it's completely open. It can be downloaded around the world and it, really is a system all of its own. I want you to think about the human reference genome as just being a coordinate system, the same way we use GPS maps or anything else, base by base, the human reference genome have enabled researchers to study using their own data sets, basic questions about basic health sciences. They've been able to flag new variants that are important for understanding human health and even biotechnologies for clinical new developments. And much like we've heard about the excitement of the archaic and ancient genome projects, this has really allowed us to dig in and study in reference to this base-by-base -base coordinate system, um, how we vary the population level and between different communities. Now, I thought this was quite interesting when I started working with reference genomes years and years back, that in fact, this whole data sharing standards of being open and making this international product is really one of the, the outcomes of the human genome project itself. In fact, there are very limited sharing standards that were established before the 1990s. Next slide, please. It was really in 1996 that we had a group of researchers really surrounded by this concept of the release of the next human genome project, um, really coming together and saying, what are our principles that we want to stand behind in terms of open data sharing and accessibility to ensure that this is something that's equitable around the world. And they came up with a number of different points here I've listed on the slide. They want automatic release of assemblies larger than a thousand bases. They wanted you know, this to happen really quickly, 24 hours, no delays, no exceptions. Um, immediate publications followed by the annotated sequences. And all in all, the goal here was to make these, this human genome project freely accessible to the public 
And so that it could really um, increase the amount of research and development to maximize the benefit to society. Of course, all of us know this story, perhaps, that a lot of this was it's meant to be the benefit of society, but it was actually coming up against the criteria of Solera, which was a competing interest at the time that was wanting to commercialize the human genome. So this really formalized the need to sit down and document what open data sharing would look like. Next slide. There are actually two um, individual meetings that really kind of set the open data sharing standards for human genetics and genomics back then. Of course, I just introduced the Bermuda Principles, which were two meetings between 1996 and 1997. And that was followed by the Fort Lauderdale Agreement, which was organized by the Wellcome Trust back in 2003. Um, next slide. And although they both emphasized open access publishing, um, this really the outcome of the Fort Lauderdale was a shared system of responsibility across the funding agencies and resource producers and resource users to allow this type of open data sharing and idea of how we would move forward as a community to ensure that we all were able to access this type of genomic data. Next slide. Of course, this is all blue sky, but if only it were that simple, right? Next slide. Now we're 20 years out from the release of the first human genome project. There's no specific universal policy that says that research groups have to share their human data in any particular format or database next. And we have a ton of genomic data, too much genomic data. I mean, it's almost to the point where that's part of the problem. Um, in the challenges that I'm outlining here, I think anyone who's ever worked with human genetic data sharing understands that everyone has their own custom database, complex methods of how they're downloading, sharing, annotating their data. Um, there's no policing at this type of scale that would enforce some of the, the principles that were outlined for data that were generated with open consent model for data sharing. Um, there's also legal and ethical considerations that must be respected in order for controlled access and how one engages with data sets that are behind controlled access and how they don't build these silos has been a constant conversation for the genetics and genomics community. And overall, there's an equity here driven by cost. Cost to generate the data and cost to access the data um, that's really kind of created a, a, an uneven playing field for how genetic and genomic research is being done. Next slide, please. We're all searching for solutions. This is something that's um, active and ongoing. One idea was with uh, the use of GWAS studies or these associations of nucleotides that are correlative with variants of disease. And there was an idea that perhaps we could create a GWAS catalog. In this case, we're not releasing the data itself, but mainly a, a summarized statement of you know, different classes or metadata that were gleaned from accessing these GWAS studies. And that maybe by creating these aggregated scores and sharing them more broadly, it would open up once again, a more equitable playing field for accessing data. Um, in this case, the return, the researchers get um, kind of an incentive here because they get pre-publication accession ideas. They can use their preprints and submit manuscripts. So there's some effort here to try to create some economy um, for, for using and sharing data this way. Next slide, please. Of course, this isn't good enough. Because once you start to boil down the data into these very summarized statistics, now a lot of this um, quality of the data is hidden and it makes it not necessarily reproducible, which is a, a really important point for genetics as we move into 10 years of a lot of sequencing technology growth and development. There's also information that one can't capture just by having these summarized statistics and a real need for individual level genome data and linked phenotypic type data. Next slide, please. We're still searching for solutions. One that I'm pretty excited about was um, this flagship project called the Anvil. This is analysis, visualization, informatics lab space. Um, essentially, this is trying to address this problem where there's so much big data and the cost of accessing it, meaning for the researcher to download that data locally, process the data, and then release the data as in, in forms of data analysis and results is it really once again introduces equitable problem of, of how much money that takes in time. And what we're trying to do is change or flip that protocol. Um, I say we very generally, a huge group of, of scientists here, just trying to create an infrastructure that's all cloud-based. So instead of having to download the data locally or, or try to work through it that way, you have a more federated system, everything's interoperable, and you can kind of create the software environment where researchers can kind of plug in to a, a cloud which has the correct controlled access, controlled um, 
data information that's necessary to not only protect the people who are giving their data, but also provide a, a cost-effective strategy for researchers to do big science around the world. Next slide, please. A lot of this growth of how to think about um, how to do these big projects initiatives and how to utilize um, human genomic data kind of have been launching in parallel with steps from something called a Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, uh, GA4GH, which was launched in 2013. Here, the idea is you're creating standards for a multitude of these genomic databases around the world. I think there was a lot of enthusiasm um, kind of in line with the, how we thought about the initial human genome project, that maybe you could create this giant silo or not silo or break down the silos and just have data that everyone could use and rules to use it. But that seems to be a little bit naive. I think now folks are, are leaning more to creating a system of standards of data integration and use that can open it up and make data more accessible around the world. I love this quote by Peter Goodhand, who is the chief executive at GA4GH. Essentially what he was trying to do is give an analogy of global data use, similar to how we think about global phone use, in the sense that there's a huge competition between phone companies and between service providers. However, they all have to work on the same network. So if you can think about GA4GH is trying to create that network where everyone can work together and do data sharing in a way that's responsible. And next slide, please. And one of the main tenets of how to do this type of data engagement is using federated platforms. I'm sure many of us are familiar to this, but essentially data is distributed across many databases and computers around the world. And they're all virtually connected more or less in this kind of seamless authorized use. So you kind of have more of this controlled access when you dial in, um, but it's not on the ownership of, of the particular user on the other side. And in contrast to a lot of the large centralized data repositories, this allows a lot of the legal data control to actually stay within its original jurisdiction. And so this is something that I think is really building um, on a number of different platforms. The Anvil that I introduced before is trying to use this federated platform Form, as well as a lot of the different data sharing um, analyses and, and team building and driver projects from GA4GH. Next slide, please. One in particular is something called the Matchmaker Exchange Project that's launched back in 2013. This is another example of a federated um, platform or a way to exchange information between researchers where you can link genetic variants to rare diseases. Um, this is one of the, the programs in alliance with the GA4GH once again. And it's allowing um, researchers who study rare diseases to actually plug in to about eight different um, organizations which are collecting information. So you can begin to match make um, between these researchers with rare variants to information that might've been otherwise hidden away in a silo. Next question, next slide. So now it gets to the point of how, what are the principles behind these data sharing? It's not the, what I was trying to introduce to you at the beginning of my talk was the need to have this type of reference that's equitable and shared around the world and how we're all pouring data into it. And the infrastructure we're trying to design around how we share that data that's being poured into the reference genome. And now there have to be key principles about how that data is being generated and how it's being managed and how it's being responsible. Um, managed in a way that can be best to the responsible of the people and purpose oriented. Um, essentially, what we were talking about is the fair and care principles. I'm sure many of you are very familiar in this. Um, essentially, when you're talking about fair, this is supporting the discovery of good data management, um, making sure that your data is findable, has correct metadata accessions, a unique identifier that's accessible, the protocols are available to you, how it was generated. Um, you're able to actually search to pull these data up in a, a reproducible way. There's interoperability that I was talking about before where you can seamlessly work with different software packages to analyze these particular data sets and that they're reusable, that they actually have, um, they can last the test of time, right? And then there's a collective benefit here that has to be taken into. When you start thinking about care, this is um, really thinking about the benefit of those who provided the data. Um, and making sure that they have the authority to control the data. This is the A in care, of course. And then R is the reason to, uh, reasons to share and how much data is being shared, really giving that responsibility of, of the data behind it. And ethics, you really wanna minimize harm and you wanna maximize justice. We, there's imbalance of power. And so a lot of the ethics here is, is critically important to ensure that the data management and stewardship um, has as highly principled as we move forward. Next slide, please. So 
in all of this uh, growth that we've seen since 1990 with the dawn of the Human Genome Project, we're now walking into a new world where we're thinking about how to create, once again, an international reference genome, one that's better positioned to represent and serve humanity. Next slide, please. The first human reference genome was largely describing the genomic information from a single individual who was a, an individual from Buffalo, New York. I'm showing the breakdown of what we call GRCH38, which is our human reference genome, as being 57% European, 37 African, and 6% Asian, using um, some of the population labels that were provided in the green et al. back in 2010. No single human reference genome can represent all of the diversity that we see around the world. And we have a real problem right now with trying to capture that kind of information and representation around the world. Here I'm showing you a figure from Martin et al. back in 2019, where we're looking at individuals involved in these GWAS studies, where we have kind of a breakdown once again, based on these very broad global populations based on billions. And instantly you can see that we have a flooding of information from Europeans um, in the system. So in, and we just have inadequate representation of genetic information around the world. Next slide, please. And this has, that really affects the way that we think about development of new therapeutics, how we are going to improve healthcare outcomes equitably around the world, because we're basing a lot of our biomedical research or a lot of our studies based on an skewed group of communities of European populations. And so in this case, um, what we would love to do is to try to change that model and try to create a reference genome that, that serves as a better lens to the human haplotypes that are on the population today. Next slide, please. So this was a call to action. Why I'm here right now is because NHGRI, uh, one of the ICs of NIH, wanted to improve the human reference genome, um, take a step back from where we had made so much progress and see if we can't change the scope of the human reference genome to now represent an improved representation of haplotype diversity of human populations around the world. Uh, the number that we're looking at is at least 350 individuals. However, I think all of us probably understand that's going to be an underestimate to really capture this level of diversity. So this is a start. Where we're moving is to build more complete and comprehensive maps of genome variation and in doing this, we have to move away from kind of this single reference genome into now a reference genome that's describing 350 minimally individual genomes. So we have to kind of break the wheel, so to speak, of all of our tools. Everything has to start working in terms of what we call pangenomics, where it's kind of a multiple alignment of many, many, many reference genomes. So there's a whole new tooling ecosystem and a whole new way of doing genetics and genomics that we're going to have to try to do seamlessly so we don't lose those genomic and genetic researchers that have been working with us for so many decades now. Next slide. Doing this project, it takes a major step forward and a major step to look back and actually reference all the historic missteps that have happened. Maybe it was in the past diversity projects where there have been threats of colonialism and vampire project, even to the general mistrust of giving blood or or biospecimens to researchers to do any kind of genetic and genomic testing. We've seen these stories, I'm just showing three here, um, over and over again. And so this idea of the trying to benefit and serve individuals with genetics and genomics has to take into account that there's a long road ahead to ensure that we can start to build trust once again. Next slide. So far, we're three years into the program. We've made tremendous progress so far, but I wanna emphasize that the reason why we've been able to make such fast progress, even through a global pandemic, is because we have benefited from cell lines that have been already consented for open data sharing and use available to us through the Thousand Genomes Consortium. This was a consortium that was launched back in 2008. Um, there are 26 global populations and communities that are represented. Over 3,000 individuals have been banked and our Coriol Biobank. And all of these particular cell lines, once we go through our estimate of quality evaluation, can then be selected and brought into this type of reference 
effort. So far, we have over 110 individuals where we have extremely high quality reference genomes, which exceed our current reference genome, HD30A. However, we're at an inflection point, which is why I really appreciate being the last talk, because a lot of our biggest hurdles and challenges that we are going to have to face, the center versus periphery, this asymmetry of balance, this idea of who we are benefiting with our resource is coming ahead in the sense that we're about to launch new recruitment and bring in new participants. And now we have to start asking in our consent documents, you know, are you willing to share your data without restriction around the world? Next slide, please. Our current data sharing model benefits from all of the things I introduced at the beginning, Fort Lauderdale agreement. It also operates on the Anvil. We're in alliance with GA4GH. All of our data is instantly brought into the cloud. We have off, often frequent release. As soon as it's quality assessed, we try to get it up within a very amazingly short time period to ensure it's in the hands of researchers. Next slide. And so, so far, this has been largely funded as an NIH initiative. That was part of how my talk was introduced. However, over the next three years, what we're trying to build is something bigger than what we're doing. We're calling it the Human Pan Genome Project to really celebrate the initial Human Genome Project, which was an international collaborative initiative. This is once again aimed to bring a federated group of scientists who are interested in improving the reference genome to share the same virtual table of which we will be one of those participants at the table. This, we hope, will share bioinformatic resources, standards, and workflows once again. And we are trying to create a forum where we can have more equitable training and outreach opportunities to ensure broad use and implementation. So this is not just a few individuals and a few institutes that have early access. Next slide, please. In doing so, we're adopting um, the GA4GH principles that enable the responsible genomic data sharing and human rights framework. And we're trying to once again create, as I introduced my very first slide, that tangible human genome project. It may represent more individuals than the initial one, but that can be used and downloaded equitably around the world to once again drive new basic, new clinical, and new population genetic studies that we haven't been able to access fully and completely yet, because we've had such a lean on a Western European or a single genome. With that, I think next slide. With that, I'll, in my talk, a lot of this work that I'm representing today is from a consortium based effort known as the Human Pan Genome Reference Consortium. And I encourage everyone to visit our website for the total number of contributors at that, at that site. I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. Thanks to all our speakers uh, for these excellent presentations. Uh, we will now be moving into our Q&A and discussion session, which will be moderated by Dr. Pete Brocius, who is a distinguished professor uh, in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Georgia and founding director of the Center for Integrative Co Conservation Research at UGA. Pete, I'll hand it over to you. Okay, thank you, uh, Joseph, and thanks to all the presenters for really, um, really, really interesting uh, presentations. It's really a privilege to share this uh, venue with with uh, with all of you. Um, <clears throat> so I think uh, it's it's important to just note very briefly that the Nagoya Protocol is uh, that the two pillars of the Nagoya Protocol are genetic, quote unquote, resources and traditional knowledge, and as someone who was um, in Nagoya in 2010 when the Nagoya Protocol was negotiated, I think it's important to stress um, that the protocol comes from a legacy of Global North, Global South imbalance, um, recognition of some of the inequities involved in that that several of you have, have referenced, um, as well as the experience of indigenous and local communities also with respect to some of those inequities and legacies of extraction. Um, within my discipline, anthropology as well, I think within climatology and other disciplines, um, there are a series of evolving institutions, conventions, um, uh, evolving conversations around the politics of knowledge, around coloniality um, uh, and indigeneity. And uh, of course, long histories and legacies of 
distrust with respect to how the scientific community have, have, have engaged um, with communities in the global south and with nation states. Um, and I think increasingly we recognize um, that the very terms we use to describe our science, whether we're talking about genetic resources or use of provider countries or even the word data embed and perpetuate legacies of coloniality broadly construed. Um, and all of this uh, has uh, implications for how we think about science, uh, how we think about what it means to do science, uh, who are we producing knowledge for, who owns data, et cetera. Um, and now speaking uh, specifically with my anthropologist hat on, I think anthropology has been particularly self-conscious and, and I would say a self-critical discipline, um, uh, but I think we have things to share with other disciplines that emerge from the kinds of questions that we ask ourselves. Um, <clears throat> what we've seen here in these presentations is a diversity of approaches in how we approach research, uh, whether we're talking about the field situation or lab situations, um, whether we're talking about human or non-human uh, uh, genomics, um, and, and really then the question of how we can distill from this diversity of approaches some common themes or guidelines about what it means to do research responsibly. So um, <clears throat> with that, uh, with that, uh, um, with those comments, um, I'd like to uh, open it up for, I think, uh, Joe Chino, we're going to uh, field questions for about 10 minutes. Um, we're going to shift slightly from the agenda since we're running a bit late. So please post any questions you have in the Q&A, which um, I'll be uh, monitoring. If there are no questions, then um, I'd like to um, direct some questions to our three panelists uh, specifically. Um, so I'll uh, pause for a second here and see if any questions come through on the on the Q&A. So Pete, there are no questions currently on the Q&A. So maybe we can go ahead as uh, go ahead with one of your questions. All right, that's fine. That's fine. So um, yeah. So in your uh, presentations, each of you accentuated what we often refer to as the politics of knowledge. You may not have used that terminology, but um, but the politics of knowledge in scientific research by pointing to, um, in Augustine's case, the whole dynamics of center and periphery, um, but other asymmetries built on legacies of, of coloniality, uh, questions of, of uh, um, unequal access, uh, benefits, et cetera, all the things that gave rise to the Novaya Protocol. Um, at the same time, I think it's important to acknowledge the current ubiquity of calls to decolonize our research and our practice. And so I'd like to ask each of you if you could say something briefly um, about what decolonizing means to each of you in the context of persistent patterns of, of, of inequality in genomic and other kinds of uh, scientific research and how your experience can also inform other disciplines, especially in the biosciences. I'll, I'll jump in really quickly. Uh, thanks, Pete, for that. Um, and, and just really in a nutshell for the two cases, right, the sort of primatological case study and the ancient DNA case study. In the primatological world, the realm of primatology right now, I think there's a real sort of shift uh, towards a decolonial or a restructuring of the center periphery ecology. And I think that's really important. So I think it takes the shape of moving away from this notion of, of providers and users, which I would argue is reinforcing, that terminology reinforces the kind of politic of, of inequity uh, towards the notion where researchers, indigenous and local communities in the areas of focus, the study where, for example, the uh, other than human primates exist, where those relationships and those knowledges are being produced, where the genetic resources and traditional knowledge is coming from that is then talked about globally or published largely in English in the global north, that there is a, a move to recognize that the questions, the funding, and the framing right, of projects should be decentered from the sort of global north traditional powers, 
into a peripheral, which should be the center, right? Which is the locus of the information at hand. And so I think that shift is happening, but slowly. And I would argue there's many, many things to talk about here. But the one thing I'll just say is that the funding agencies, right, that are involved in providing the necessary tools, the finances for these kinds of researchers have not yet come to terms or really come to grips with the urgency and the necessity to restructure basic funding parameters um, such that the periphery becomes the a co-center in constructing the knowledges, in constructing the ways in which we think about genetic resources and their DSI, right? Once these things are out in the open and, and engaged, how do we do that? Those questions should be centered in the sources, not in the traditional sort of extractive technological uh, infrastructurally funded places. So that's in the primatological realm. In the ancient DNA realm, just very briefly, it is absolutely clear, and, and I had a, a few slides in there, just a few citations to take a couple examples. One is the center periphery, the fact that there are a few major ADNA infrastructure labs that are um, industrial grade. And then the, there are a myriad of others spread in areas that are largely not in the global north, but also in the global north, that are attempting, that are engaging, that are crafting questions, but are doing sort of different pace and different construct and bringing to the table different potential uh, outcomes. And I think we need to reprioritize again with the funding and with the pace of engagement of research and publishing. Um, those things need to be rethought, centered around the enhancement of infrastructure and knowledges in the periphery, not in the center, such that that periphery center boundary, that whole discourse, we should not be talking about periphery center. That should be being restructured to differential sources of the infrastructure summation. And finally, I'll come back to the funding on this. There's where it sits. And particularly with the large laboratories who are university funded, private foundation funded, and governmentally funded in Europe and the United States, it is the funding that has to drive, or that should drive. I mean, there should be the ethical and moral, technological, intellectual contributions driving this. But I think at the end of the day, it's the funding that's gonna drive that. And so the call is, I think, for funders to get on to thinking with and about the sort of core principles of, of the Nagoya Accords of the CBD and to think about what that might mean. If, if I could sort of uh, add to that a little bit, I think, What's important here too, in, in terms of breaking down that core periphery relationship, as it were, really means that we that we really have to integrate folks from all corners, uh, from the ground up, and it's going to take time and it's going to take investment. But that investment absolutely must be made, and and this can relate back to also funding bodies. It's, it's partially monetary. So, you know, many of these underfunded countries, they don't, they simply don't have the funds to construct the labs and therefore train the next generation of scholars and so on and so forth. So there needs to be something built within that particular funding scheme that helps offset that balance. It's almost like a, you know, carbon offset scheme when you, when you buy an airplane ticket or so on and so forth. But more so, it's about knowledge transfer, right? And so identifying um, and working together as collectively as a group to bring everything up together, it's, it's, we're there, we need, this needs to happen. It needs to happen now because otherwise this, we're, we're getting, as, as Augustine pointed out, we've, we've got a hyper-industrialization process going on. We've got a very strong trajectory in that way, another kind of colonialism. And, and that's becoming actually more and more entrenched, entrenched as time goes on. You know, money attracts more money. It's all getting funneled into one place. Yes, there are these smaller labs that are filling in um, these cracks. And I think doing some very exciting and, and, and arguably uh, more thoughtful, engaged work and also setting the seeds for having a more integrated uh, uh, sort of uh, knowledge transfer that's helping to break down that core periphery. But, it's, it's, it needs to be kind of pushed along a little bit faster. And I think, you know, the time is now. Thanks. And I'll just briefly mention, uh, of course, uh, colonialism, I think, always with this idea that you're pulling reference genomes that represent ancestries outside of the United States has to be a consideration. It's something that keeps us all up at night. I think that a question is who owns this research resource that we're developing, right? Who, who benefits from this? And how can we 
work as hard as we can to keep those two questions at the front of our mind at all times. And it's going to be imperfect. And then we're going to make mistakes and nobody wants to make mistakes. But as long as that is our, as our goal, like who, you know, can we make an ownership global? Can we do that? It's, you know, that's, that's actually an interesting question all of its own, because right now it feels like really acknowledging the, the two answers before me, there's funding, there's an economic behind this that's driving it, but there are some countries which are in position to create pan genome re- reference resources. And so there are silos that are already being built. There are already inequities being on the playing field. So how do we start to bring everyone to want to play together? What's that incentivized, um, you know, kumbaya moment that everyone realizes that working together, we build something that's a better sum of all of us. You know, I think that that's really the North Star that we're going to have to to follow because otherwise this does have threatened, um, you know, imbalance, asymmetries. And I, I don't know the answer. I think that was mentioned on the chat as well with how to secure the funding structure to make it more equitable. That would be a, a, a supreme help as mentioned. But without that, there just has to be kind of that, those questions always on the researcher's mind of, of how to motivate action to, to create a project and a, a product that's best um, for those who are using it. I, I, let me just jump in really quickly because I think it's very important also to, to rip off of that, Karen, a little bit, this idea of, of traditional knowledge and genomic processes and patterns, genomic materials from indigenous groups, local groups, and groups that I think the, the idea of always open and always sharing has been pushed against. And I think that understanding that when you cannot access groups and in, in some context, I think, or materials, I think that's also a possibility. And I think a different sort of political level with the goal of always ubiquitous open access or sharing, we have to be very careful with that. And I think through that, think through that very carefully. And here again, I referenced the a Singh Consortium for some publications, really dealing with the complexities there and how we move forward to a more equitable understanding and collaboration, rather than just the sort of uh, a broad uniform access component. And just to comment there, just because to keep this, <laughs> I feel like that is an incredibly important point. And when we first launched the consortium, we instantly aligned with the, and the National Center for Indigenous Genomics and Genetics that are happening out of um, Australia to try to take lessons and notes of how to partner with communities where perhaps open data sharing isn't an assumed criteria, right? And that uh, there's more control over biospecimens and there's more control over if you want to pull out at any time, done, right? So I feel like there, this has really influenced the, our thinking, um, at least behind the scenes of the Human Pan Genome Reference Consortium, in the sense that we don't have the answers yet, but I think that there must be this type of attention to a gray zone where it can't be always open data sharing, always open access, you know, where you kind of lose um, control more or less uh, because there's, there's cultural um, considerations that need to be made on after someone dies, you know, what happens to those cells, to that DNA um, that I think that we, we really need to think deeply about. And so we do have an organized working group and, you know, behind the scenes that are trying to think deeply about these questions before even, starting, you know, to motivate any action in that direction, because we do clearly agree with, with what's being presented here. Thanks for, thanks for those responses. Um, I'm going to follow up with one other uh, question regarding ethics, and then we can go to the Q&A uh, if we have time. So when it comes to genomics research and DSI, there's been a lot of discussion of ethical codes as guides to doing research responsibly, acknowledging, of course, that even the meaning of, of responsibly um, is, is itself evolving. Yet, for those who are asking critical questions about, you know, again, legacies of coloniality broadly, um, broadly defined, and politics of knowledge and so forth, ethical frameworks are potentially uh, problematic because they begin and end with intentions. Um, intentions, I would argue um, in, in this question, are not a great guide to action when they embody, you know, for instance, various forms of obliviousness. You can be well-intentioned and oblivious. Um, you know, I think Torquemada was probably well-intentioned during the Spanish Inquisition, right? Um, uh, by his own definition. So, uh, you know, a lot of bad things in history have happened um, uh, and been caused by those with good intentions. So how do we create guides to action in the conduct of research 
that are responsive to these kinds of uh, considerations. Be open to actually listening to and collaborating with uh, your local indigenous communities, participants, the folks that are equally relevant in the construction of the questions in the data analysis and in the decisions about its dissemination. Being absolutely open and to listen. And again, the funder should also support that infrastructurally. I, I would even uh, push that one step further. And if we're talking largely, now that we're talking largely about you know, laboratory-based work is, you know, don't just listen, you know, stay with that community for a little while. Um, Go and live there for a bit. Um, you know, it's 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 very. It's a, I'm not saying it's not a good idea to go for a few days and and have a big chat about these kinds of things. It's it's important, but it's only a first step because there's also additional layers of political complexity within that given community or country that you might not be well aware of. Okay, and there are certain things that can be said and that cannot be said within a particular context when you're speaking with communities. There are issues there about how you know do you uh, how does that community treat uh, a visitor, for example? If it's a culture of hospitality, you're never going to say anything that is uh, going to rock the boat or or come across as perhaps potentially insulting. So you know when you stay in a region for a little bit, you know you get to know these kinds of things, and also it's about building up of, of a longer term trust as well. And then when these conversations happen, the listening becomes deeper and everything becomes much more meaningful. And I think, I think that's really important, um, especially as these laboratory analyses, these genomic analyses, they pick up pace and there are just more and more of them being done. And, and it's, it's, we gotta slow down a tiny bit in order to make sure we're doing this right, because especially in the case of archeological materials, we're not gonna get a second chance to do this. And just very briefly, I guess, echoing a lot of the themes that have already been brought up, I think there's this new kid on the block. You know, you're not going to be, have the time to build the trust and the deep relationships that are necessary um, to do this type of community-based work and genomic um, engagement. And so I feel like at least to kind of develop that sense of trust is by developing a, a network of, at that level of researchers who have already had the multi-year experience and deep connections and community building um, that support, you know, the the ethics that hopefully are, you know, everyone's on the same page with, but at the same time, it is kind of that creating that top level network to ensure that the, the folks that are actually doing the engagement that ensure the benefit, that ensure that um, kind of day-to-day -day access um, are the ones that have had the longest, deep, um, meaningful relationships with these various communities. And also, I think that there's a, a motivation to, to work on that level of, of networks where you, you have a lot of communities that come and work together, that sounds like a, a kumbaya moment once again, but it's not just always information transfer from one side, um, that there's an acknowledgement that this is a, a two-directional, multi-directional information transfer. And that also that once that information is transferred, it doesn't just stay there, that that next network can communicate and transfer information to. And so a lot of the training of what we're trying to do with reference genomes, I think there's gonna be a, a steep learning curve um, because it's gonna be something completely new. And the sooner that we can get trainers that can train others, you know, then I think that that could launch into a kind of broader use and, and more community driven use of this product versus just one kind of beacon on the hill trying to, you know, share information. So we're, I don't want to pretend like I have all the answers, but these are just thoughts of, of how we're thinking about these types of engagements now. Thanks again to all of you. Uh, I'm going to defer to Jotes now. Uh, can, uh, can we take another question from the Q&A um, box or shall we, let's do one more question. Um, yeah. um, and I guess I'd like to uh, pose a question raised by um, one of the anonymous attendees and I'm just going to read it. Um, uh, Nagoya calls mostly for bilateral agreements based more on the provider user paradigm. Bilateralism is much more onerous than a multilateral system such as the treaty. Um, that is the Nagoya Protocol, I assume. Is there a way to create a fair and equitable non-colonial system such as Dr. Miga mentioned that is also multilateral, easy to understand, and reasonably agile 
to engage and use. And if I may editorialize, I think this really brings up the question of some of the complexities of the Nagoya Protocol um, that, that make it very um, difficult to, to kind of grasp, uh, you know, <laughs> what mechanisms exist and how to uh, comply with them. I mean, there's a lot of, uh, it's true, it's incredibly complex, and, and but the bottom line is, if one refuses a binary or a bilateral frame for this and thinks more against extractive or, you know, um, sort of a, a colonial mindsets, then one by necessity recognizes multiple, not stakeholders, but multiple collaborators and particip participants, multiple co-creators of the questions, of the projects, of the thinking through. Uh, and again, how does that you know, happen? Well, one critical way that this happens, there are many, but I'm just going to say one, and one is to ensure structures that provide infrastructure in the areas where the source data are coming from, be that traditional knowledge, be that uh, genomic materials, what have you. That is, infrastructure in situ must be there so that all of the analyses, all of the industry, all of the infrastructure is not always somewhere else which, where, which also coincides with centers of colonial power and, and finances. So infrastructure that is globally distributed is a central component to begin this kind of project, I would say. I don't have any easy answers, but I do appreciate a lot of the genomic data set moving to a federated cloud-based system because it does make it more of an economical use. And I know there's no easy way to share funding, but you can teach uh, you know, people how to utilize these resources, but there's no funding to actually operate on the cloud or access to computers, you know, things like that. I feel like that's always going to be a limiting step noting to infrastructure, but with it being more of a federated system on the cloud, the idea is that hopefully that would break down some of those, um, those barriers that may inhibit certain communities from accessing this information and allow you know, a, a more accessible framework for new variant discoveries that could be based on genomes from that community that could help that community. Um, it sounds like it, there will always be a balance here where, where folks will move more quickly, you know, in access. But I think that that's one that the federated place where people are, are investing data sharing, I think, at least in my personal opinion, outside of the Human Pan Genome Reference Consortium is a smart way to do it, to try to create equity. Okay, uh, Cheryl, do you want to offer anything or have the last word if you wish? <laughs> I, I mean, I, I have a little to add because it's, it, of course, it's, it's a very complex issue to say the least, but I think, you know, what we have to, I, I, I think this idea of, of building an infrastructure in across the, across the world in this global sense, it, it is really key to some of the things that we were discussing earlier about transfer of knowledge and, and again, keeping in mind that transfer of knowledge is a two-way street. So I think, I hope, I'm hoping that's the direction we'll be heading. It probably can't happen fast enough, um, but we can continue to hope. Thanks to all of you. I'll turn it over to Jetson. Thank you, Pete, and thank you all for that extremely engaging and fascinating discussion and for sharing your, your thoughts and perspectives on this really important and timely issue. Uh, unfortunately, we're at the end of our time. I wish we had more time for discussion. Um, and this is our final workshop in the series, but I just wanna remind our participants that this is only the beginning and not the end of our conversation. Uh, we can continue the discussion and share ideas uh, on this topic um, on our discussion portal on learnnagoya.com. Uh, this will also be where we will post today's recording and other materials and resources on the topic. So please take advantage of this community space and share your questions, your ideas, your perspectives, and continue the discussion. And in closing, I just want to thank our speakers for their time and input and for sharing their perspectives and to Pete Brocious for moderating the discussion. Thanks once again uh, to our host societies, uh, AAA and ASP, for supporting this event and to all our partner societies in this series. Uh, thanks to NSF for sponsoring this workshop series led by AIBS in partnership with the USA Nagoya Protocol Action Group. And uh, thank you to Ed and uh, Lynn for joining us and for introducing our speakers today. And finally, a big thank you to all our attendees today for joining us and participating. 
we really hope that you will continue to engage in these discussions. And thanks for sticking around a few minutes longer um, uh, with the, uh, during the discussion.